A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications, with loud cries and tears, to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say that is hard to explain, since you have become dull in understanding. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. For the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now, my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Who were those Greeks? And why? Did they wish to see Jesus? We're at something of a turning point today. Lent is steadily drawing to a close. If you've given up something for the season, you're probably already counting down the days until you can end your fast. In church, we're counting down the days to Holy Week, of course, which begins next Sunday. Palm Sunday. And I've heard great things about Francesca. I'm very much looking forward to meeting her. We're also at a turning point in the Gospel according to St. John. In the first 12 chapters 
we're introduced to Jesus' public ministry as he works his signs, as he teaches and engages in controversy with the religious leaders of his day. From this point on, though, Jesus is going to focus on teaching his disciples, his closest companions. Today's reading gives us Jesus' final appearance on the public stage and provides the bridge to the story of his crucifixion. We're in Jerusalem. It's the feast of the Passover, when the Jews, Jesus and his disciples included, have come to celebrate their journey from slavery in Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai to the Promised Land. And the shadow of the cross is already beginning to fall across Jesus. His passion, suffering and death are not far away. And in the face of that, Jesus does something extraordinary. He makes clear to those around him that the old ways are about to change. And in particular, he speaks of drawing everyone to him. Everyone. Because of his passion, because of his coming death, because of the pain and suffering that he will go through, because he will be lifted up from the earth, because of all this, all people will be drawn to him. By his passion and death, Jesus brings in a new covenant, a covenant that includes people, a covenant that is written on the heart, a covenant of love. And this is the gospel. This is the very essence of the gospel. This is what Jesus came to tell us, and more than that, came to embody. That nobody can be left out ever again. That nobody can be excluded from the love of God. That God's love leaves nobody out and includes the unexpected. Everyone is included in the love of God. On the cross, Jesus draws us and the whole world to himself. On the cross, Jesus reveals to us the heart of our gracious God, who loves each and every one of us. Jesus' life and death, his crucifixion and resurrection, are not judgment and condemnation. They are invitation and promise. Jesus draws each and every one of us to him, offering us relationship and abundant life. This is the gospel. This is the very essence of the gospel. But what about those Greeks? Those Greeks who were amongst the first to hear this extraordinary message. Who were they? And why did they wish to see Jesus? Those Greeks were, in all likelihood, Gentiles, non-Jews, who were attracted to the high ethical standards of Judaism and who loved God and who came to worship in Jerusalem. They were called God-fearers. But for all their fear of the Lord, these Greeks didn't actually belong. They certainly weren't part of the mainstream Judaism of Jerusalem. They were foreigners. They were outsiders. And so they must have felt some trepidation and unease as they made their way around Jerusalem. I think we can detect this when they approach Philip and politely, ever so gently, make their simple request. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And who can blame them for wishing to see Jesus? For this is the man who had turned water into wine, 
who had healed the son of the royal official and the paralytic, and had given sight to the man born blind, who had fed 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, who had walked on water, and now who, just a short time ago, had raised Lazarus from the dead. It's this Jesus whom the Greeks wish to see, this man with a message who has been creating quite a stir. The outsiders long to see Jesus. They long to get close to Jesus, to hear what he has to say. But you'll have noticed that this apparently creates something of a problem. They approach Philip. He doesn't seem to know what to do. So he turns to Andrew. Andrew at least seems to have had the confidence to approach Jesus with Philip by his side. So when the Greeks came asking, we wish to see Jesus, they evidently raised all sorts of dilemmas for those closest to Jesus. Were these people, these outsiders, a part of God's plan for the world? Were these people included in God's love? Were these people fit to meet with Jesus? And the response from Jesus himself, as we've seen, is extraordinary. So not only does Jesus explain that the old ways are about to change, that a new covenant is on its way, he does so in response to an approach from some outsiders. And he tells those outsiders that this new covenant isn't based on outward keeping of the law, it isn't based on race, it isn't based on who your ancestors are, it isn't based on being Jewish, it's a covenant that's written on the heart. It's a covenant of love. And love for all. Jesus' eyes are open to all the people around him. Jesus' heart is open to the whole world. To insiders and apparent outsiders. To you and to me. So, who are the Greeks today? As today's disciples of Jesus, you and I may well think of ourselves as being rather like Philip and Andrew, right there at the centre of the action, as it were. But I wonder, are we perhaps more like those Greeks? Are we still those who wish to see Jesus? Do we wish to see Jesus in our shared life and worship, through the hearing of scripture and the sharing of the Eucharist? Do we wish to see Jesus in our outreach to the community? And if we are more like those gently inquiring Greeks than the well-established disciples, what is it that holds us back? What holds you back? What holds me back from seeing Jesus, from encountering Jesus? Our own expectations and desires, our busyness and preoccupations? Is it that we wish to experience Jesus on our own terms, in our own way? In all of this, whether we have the confidence of Andrew, the uncertainty of Philip, or the inquiring mind of those Greeks, in all of this, Jesus sees us and holds us in his loving gaze. In spite of the barriers we put up, Jesus can reach through and encounter us not on our terms, but on his. The relationship into which he draws us, the relationship he offers us, is a relationship of intimacy in which we lay bare our souls so that they may be healed. Jesus draws us to him, offering us relationship, 
and abundant life. And when we respond to him in faith, we encounter and experience him in the fullness of his grace and taste the life he wants us to live, where all are one in Christ Jesus. So, <clears throat> as we approach the transition to Holy Week, the cross and the tomb, let us prepare ourselves to know Jesus more fully, to abide with him, and to have the courage to let ourselves be seen by him. And let us also prepare ourselves to help others to see Jesus, to offer them through our worship, and are welcome with our lips and our lives to offer them a glimpse of the divine so that they too may know this love that draws all people to himself. Now among those at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit.
Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that the Lord be a man of our name. We may have your grace to see through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to turn to those around you with a smile and hand.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give praise. It is indeed right and just. Our duty is our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. The, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels forever praising you and singing. After supper he took the cup, and again he gave you thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this all of me. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith.
Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son. And bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Eucharist, or I will receive the sacrament myself. Then I will lead the prayer for those making a spiritual communion, which is especially for those who will be sharing in our worship online, who are unable, because of restrictions where they are, to get to the Eucharist. And then I'll communicate the altar party, and then all are welcome to come forward to receive the sacrament, which will be administered in one time, uh, or for a personal blessing. Please come forward if you would like to. Jesus, I prostrate myself before you with an unworthy yet contrite heart, humbled yet longing to be in your Eucharistic presence. I love the gift of yourself offered to me in this great and blessed sacrament. Though unable to receive this food of my journey, I desire all the graces that this encounter with you can bring, and offer my heart afresh as a place where you might dwell. While I wait for the day when I shall again have the joy of sacramental communion, I trust in your desire to abide in me and wish to possess you in spirit. Come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you.
you have taught us and what we do for these of our brothers and sisters, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reign now and forever. very good to welcome everybody here and please uh, if you can come to the Barton Centre, our parish hall for some refreshments afterwards you'll be very very welcome indeed. Just go out of the church and turn right, go past the vicarage and the hall is there. Please come if you can and if, um, and I see there's a number of folk here who I don't think have been to Christchurch before which is just one. If you would like um, uh, us to keep in touch with you, we don't nag, we just badger. <laughs> Uh, please uh, just fill in one of these cards and give it to uh, one of us, one of the clergy, and uh, we'll put you on our email list. We send out a, just a, a very friendly notification of how life is going in the parish. It keeps everyone in, in touch. Uh, anyway, just fill that in if you'd like it. Now, I saw some uh, uh, lambs come out of the vestry um, with some things in their hands, so I need someone from the lambs to come and tell me what happened in Lamb's Day. Is there anyone willing to come and do that? Or do I have to come down? <laughs> come on down. <laughs> Matthias, come and tell me what we did. So, let's have a look. Turn around, look at the congregation. You're going to look like that one day, which is a bit of a sadness. But anyway, let's... Oh, so what's that? Let me guess. It's a bookmark. Am I right? No. No, okay. <laughs> okay, so what is it then? Louis? Edward? What are you supposed to do with it? Play with it. That's a good answer. If in doubt, play with it. And we've got a drawing here. God gives light and rain. It grows, because you get light and rain. And it produces many seeds. And did you have some seeds in there? Did you grow some? No. Okay, you just looked at some seeds. Well, we might plant them and see what happens. So, Matthias, thank you so much for all your answers. I <laughs> Let's give him a round of applause. Let's give him a round of applause. Excellent. Now, brothers and sisters, and when you leave the church today, um, there's a couple of things. There's a little leaflet which tells you about the services here during Holy Week, which of course begins next Sunday, Palm Sunday, when we have, uh, by tradition, we meet with brothers and sisters from other churches, and uh, as um, uh, Deacon Russell, some of you may not have known what he meant when he talked about Francesca. Francesca is the donkey who, for the past few years, uh, has come and joined us and given a bit of life to our Palm Sunday uh, procession and Francesca will be here next Sunday and um, after the procession the Lambs next Sunday will spend a bit more time uh, with Francesca hearing about the life of a donkey. So that's next Sunday. We start at 9.45 a bit earlier because we're going to process around uh, to gather up the people from the Uniting Church and the Baptist Church and the Salvation Army and gather them into, an, into the Anglican heart. No, I'm joking. We're gonna, we meet together and enjoy, enjoy that in Brunswick there are a number of Christian communities uh, uh, all worshipping the same Lord, of course. And uh, we have a short service then in the garden here and then we come into the church for the rest of the Eucharist. That's next Sunday. And then uh, there are services through the week as we seek to be with Jesus in a very beautiful way in our liturgies through the Last Supper, Good Friday, and then to the glories of Easter. And on Easter Day, she's here this morning, our Anita is going to be baptised. And uh, I think I'm right, for the first time in 160 or many years this church has been here, it will be baptism by full immersion. The uh, Baptist Church, in an ecumenical gesture, lend, are lending us a, a, a pool and Anita will be immersed in the waters, yeah. as is the tradition 
uh, uh, it's a very beautiful course. Baptism at that font works just as well as many of you will testify. Nevertheless, symbolically, the, the going under is a very powerful, very powerful symbol indeed. As Anita is baptized and then confirmed uh, in the waters. That's at 10 o'clock on Easter Day. And after that, there is um, uh, uh, an Easter egg hunt and uh, then a shared lunch. And if you could help with the lunch, it would be great. Uh, Robin, could you just stand up, Robin? So you Robin uh, has a trusty sheet for people if they can help with the provision of food. So it takes the burden of one or two people into a shared uh, activity together. And it'll be during that lunch that we have the opportunity to give thanks for Deacon Katie's uh, ministry. Deacon Katie's been with us for uh, some time now, and uh, she's uh, uh, moving on to continue her ministry in Altona. So next Sunday, uh, on Easter Day, Sunday week, we'll have an opportunity to uh, give thanks for all that Katie has been and done for us uh, uh, over this past year. Uh, tonight at five o'clock in the Vicarage, there is just a time of informal uh, praise and then uh, some Bible study together and then refreshments and everyone is welcome to join us in the Vicarage for that. I think that's all I have to say. Could you please stand for the blessing? Uh, by the way, thank you, Eleanor, for God so loved the world. Beautifully sung. Thank you very much indeed. Christ crucified, draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Now let's go in the peace of Christ. Let's go in the peace of God.